All right, folks, uh, what a great crowd that's still here at the end of the a long day. Uh, we're very grateful to all of you for being here, for being part of our day. Before we introduce our panel, I'm going to ask David to come up and chat with me for just a minute to, first of all, give you a chance to thank him for putting this whole day together for us. Come on, David. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thanks, everybody. David had a lot of help from the Northeastern folks, but everything before the Northeastern part, he does by himself. So incredible convening power that he has. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about tomorrow and what we're going to be seeing and hearing. Yeah, very excited. Well, thank you all for this incredible day today. Most of you are going to be here tomorrow as well. So to think that all of these incredible speakers on the stage today are going to be in the audience tomorrow, and we're going to be listening to 26 chief AI officers. And as I mentioned this morning, I'm doing the research for the chief AI officer talent map. Ten years ago, I did the first ever chief digital officer talent map. And there were thousands of CDOs. There's only 250 of these people. Also this morning, we brought up a real job description of an actual job. Equifax, about a week ago, announced their need for a global chief AI officer. So this morning, we looked at the job description. We blew some holes in it. We added some things that we thought it needed. And we're all priming up our resumes to apply for that job. And, and as I mentioned, <laughs> 10 years ago, Sri Srinivasan, he was Journalism, professor of journalism for 20 years at Columbia. He was dean of the journalism school. He met, uh, he loved the Metropolitan Museum, and he actually met the head of hiring uh, at our very first event. And Sri ended up becoming, he was chief digital officer at Columbia. He became chief digital officer at the Met, and then eventually became chief digital officer under de Blasio, Mayor de Blasio. So I do hope that between today and tomorrow, I'm determined that someone from this room is going to get that job at Equifax as their global chief AI officer. And I hope that this really sets us up to help the US government fill those 200 to 400 jobs. In, the, in Biden's executive order, he mandates that federal agencies within the year have to fill hundreds of chief AI officer jobs. And there just aren't that many people on the planet. And that's why I said, you all have a great case, because I believe chief data officers, chief analytics officers, you've got all the skills to fill those roles. And imagine when we go to DC in April, we start filling those roles for the government, because you and I know we need to stay competitive, we need to beat China, we need to have the best AI program on Earth. And people I see in this audience, I, I'm convinced that we'll be able to continue and to maintain that lead. Last thing, I think people who know you only through the conference will presume you're just a conference guy, but you're not. So tell us what is what are some of the other things you do, including the very important role you play in placing jobs. Not only did I get my job at the Met, I also got, uh, I, don't, I think I told you this, I met the Chief Digital Officer of the Nobel Prizes and then got invited to the board of the Nobel Prizes, just came back on Monday from Stockholm. Uh, being on the board of the Nobel. So the community, <laughs> the connections here are amazing, and that's all through David. So tell us what you do. That's right. I forgot you met Magnus. Yeah. Magnus was a chief digital officer yep. of Nobel Media. He came to the second event. Shri met him there, and then he got invited to be on the board of the Nobel <laughs> Prize. So uh, yeah, this. Um, what was the question? <laughs> no, about your I incubated all of this uh, in 10 years ago. Well, 12 years ago, I incubated this at an executive search firm in New York City. It's called Chaddock Elig, and they've sponsored us every year since. And uh, I specialized, I wanted to specialize in, in chief digital, chief data, and chief analytics officers. So that was my practice area. I lasted about a year there, but they've supported me ever since from the very first event. My most recent placement was the chief data officer at Dow Jones last year. I put all of our search on hold temporarily because I really do want to be known in 2024 as the dominant player in placing C-level AI officers at large organizations throughout the world. So that was really my day job. You know, the events are uh, great, and I'm glad that everybody gets together. Uh, the real goal is to make sure that you continue to make connections and advance in your careers. And again, grab those AI responsibilities because it is the hottest, hottest title on the planet and we really need you 
all in positions of power. I have to say, too, I do get nervous, as I said earlier. We need, as Tim Ellis has pointed out so eloquently so many times today, to be able to trust the people. And I think this is such a collegial group. And there, we've all come to trust that you'll do the right, the ethical thing, the trustworthy thing. And uh, that's why, again, especially in US government, we need people like you in, in these spots. So I can't thank you enough. Shri pulled me up. Uh, I didn't realize I'd be saying all this. But uh, I, whatever I can do to help advance your careers, we're here. And if you ever want to be on the board of Nobel Media and Nobel Prize, <laughs> keep coming to these events. Meet us in DC. Thanks again, everybody. David Matheson, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. All right. To wrap up today, to bring us to a close, we wanted to put together a really important all-star panel, just as all our other panels have been. And the topic is data and analytics and enterprise AI playbook. We'll explore how to use data and analytics as the foundation for developing an enterprise AI program from strategy to planning to execution. And we have just a, gr a great set of people that you'll be meeting. I'll introduce the uh, uh, the moderator in just a minute because he'll be at the podium. Uh, we have with us Anthony Scrifiano is here. Please come on up. Anthony is Distinguished Fellow at the Stimson Center. Uh, we also have with us Bruno Aziza, partner at Capital G. And if you don't know what G is, you can guess once you hear what company is associated with. You can see there on the board. Uh, we also have with us Owen Roche, who's the SVP and head of production product adoption at KX. And Mojgan Lefebvre, who is EVP, Chief Operations and Technology Officer at Travelers. And our Moderator is Michael Krigsman, a publisher of CXO Talk, who runs so many different publishing and podcast opportunities. I want you to make sure you get to connect and talk to him. Please welcome Michael and the great panel. Thank you so much, Shri. Thanks so much, Shri, and thank you to uh, David. So we have truly an extraordinary panel, and you guys should check out CXO Talk, because we have amazing discussions. Uh, so to begin, why don't I just ask the panelists very briefly to introduce yourselves. Mojgan? So Mojgan Lefebvre, I'm the Chief Technology and Operations Officer for Travelers Insurance, a uh, $30 billion revenue um, and 30,000 person global property and um, casualty insurance company. I'm Anthony Scrifignano. I'm a distinguished fellow with the Stimson Center, which is a Washington, D.C. think tank. I recently retired as chief data scientist for Dun & Bradstreet. I was there for about 21 years. And Anthony, how many patents do you have? Only, only 98. 98, OK, just, just checking. Not 100? Not yet. I don't have 99 patents, but I am maybe Bruno Ziza. I'm a partner at uh, Capital G. I think I'm the only one on stage, or maybe even in this room, whose last name reads phone backwards the same way. Oh, that's cool. Is that true? <laughs> Holy Anyone else? Calendrum. That's there awesome. you go. See, I didn't tell you about that before, uh, before this. Fantastic. But uh, I um, focused on data AI and analytics. Before this job, I was running data and analytics at uh, Google Cloud. And before that, I worked at companies you probably know of, Microsoft, Business Objects, and others. So I've been in data for pretty much my entire career. Thanks. I'm Owen Roach. I'm the head of product adoption at KX. Uh, I've been there for 14 years, helping our customers maximize their ROI in our software. Um, can you hear me? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sounds like it's on now. Here we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've traditionally been in, in financial services, primarily focused on big, fast data, a database and analytics engine driving that. Um, but we quickly discovered that the same problems exist in other industries. Um, and we're now moving into generative AI and helping our customers realize some other use cases there. Can you guys hear him, or is it, does, does it need to be louder? No, OK. It's better. So go, can you raise his volume just a bit? Thanks. So, so we're talking about the data and <coughs> analytics foundation of artificial intelligence. It's an enormous topic. And I guess the fundamental first question to ask, and Anthony, let me ask. Anthony has been my friend and my mentor for many, many years. And so if we ask the question, why are we talking about this now? And also, how do we even grapple with such a huge topic? I, I have to lay the responsibility for the challenge and if we can't do it at Anthony's feet. So Anthony, with that, why are we talking about this now? Because um, 
David asked us to come and talk about it. <laughs> okay, that's a, uh, that's a good reason. No, uh, you know, fair, fair question. There's something in computer science called the Red Queen problem. It comes from Alice in Wonderland, the, the Mad Hatter Tea Party. The Red Queen says to Alice, you know, Alice says to the Red Queen, this is a strange place. I've been running and running ever since I got here, and I don't seem to be getting anywhere. And the Red Queen says, that's the kind of place this is. You have to run as fast as you can just to stay where you are. So red queen problems are like if you're in quicksand. You know, you can't stop struggling, but if you only keep struggling, you're going to die. There's no guarantee that doing what you're already doing faster or harder will make any progress, but you can't stop doing it. And the solution to red queen problems is to find a way to also do something orthogonal to everything you're doing. So the why now, I would say, is that we're in this massive red queen problem. I thought a little bit about the dimensions of the why now, um, regulatory, there's data privacy regulations, there's data localization regulations, there's probably between 30 and 40 countries right now that have some sort of AI regulation that's either nascent or, or about to be um, put into law. Um, they don't all agree with each other on basic terminology, on, on basic classification. There's that, there's the technological disruption, we've been talking about it all day. Um, responsible AI and, and generative AI and all of these other uh, many things we don't have language for yet, by the way, I would point out. So there's tech disruption, mm -hmm. there's workforce disruption, uh, not only with expectations of mobility and, and getting promoted every 15 seconds, and, but then also <laughs> the knowledge retention when those people leave those jobs and go on to the next great thing. Uh, there's the lingering effects of disruption worldwide and, and constant hyper disruption. Uh -huh. So you've got workforce mentoring, face to face. Um, I had a guy on my team that I hadn't seen in, in, for a year after I hired him. I didn't realize he was six foot five. You might have <laughs> mentioned that. It didn't come across on Zoom, right? So I walked right past him when he was in the office. And then, you know, our customers' expectations are changing. Oh. Um, and, and finally, the bad guys. The bad guys can use all this technology too. So there's seven dimensions for why now. So I didn't think I would disagree this early in our panel. <laughs> but I figured, there's one in every crowd. <laughs> I figured out, you know, uh, we discussed when we got ready for this that great panels are panels where we don't all agree on the same things. And so I give you a little bit of hard time. Also because uh, I'm very small, as you notice, I'm 5'5", five five and, and Zoom was a great equalizer for me throughout the, <laughs> so I had two great years and then people met me in person and they realized, oh, wow, uh, he's not as tall as his voice. But, what I will say is I think we're here because we all have a problem. Um, for the last 25 years, we've all invested in data. And I would say two thirds or three quarters of us have not been able to show value to the extent to which we expected it and also to the extent to which vendors and the rest of the management team expected us to do. And I think with generative AI, we have this light at the end of the tunnel that shows us what we can get closer to getting value because now people that I couldn't get to interact with the data actually can. Uh, and there's a lot of excitement on the consumer side with Gen AI tools, and it gives us the opportunity, I think, for us as data leaders to harness the opportunity we have to drive better productivity. Um, now, I think we'll discuss, you know, just like you said, of course, there's a lot of issues around it, but I think the opportunity everybody's got in this room, and hopefully we get to talk about this product mindset, is think about your career in the last 20 years. It was about protecting the data, having as little data in front of, the, in front of people as possible because we didn't know. It was about justifying the cost. How many of you have been in conversations of why do I need to buy this software, right? Nobody's asking why you need to have a CFO inside the organization, but we're all asking why we need to have a CDO. Now, luckily, my friend Randy here is at the back of the, of the room, gave me this book, and he showed in his research that 10 years ago, was it 12% 12, 12 of companies had CDOs, and now it's 70% plus. So I think the world is waking up to the opportunity. Now it's on us to have a product mindset to build these data products that are actually going to deliver value. I think up until now, we've kind of been stuck in the protection risk business. Now we have the opportunity to affect the bottom line. And technology like Gen AI makes it very visible to end users that so, value is possible. So Mojkan, I think the theme so far has been figuring out how to align our business objectives with fundamentally our underlying technology strategy. And so at Travelers, how do you think about this issue? 
So, so I just want to make sure you meant that we were, we were aligning our business objectives with the underlying technology. Is that what or, you meant? Or the other oh, way, okay. really, <laughs> yeah, really the other way around, uh, <laughs> right. yeah. ensuring that everything that we're doing aligns to what we're trying to accomplish with the business. Yeah, and so you're saying, how, how do we think of it now how do you in the think context of, of AI? So, you know, I think, and actually, like when, the, uh, when David was talking about chief AI officers, and not to say AI isn't critical, not to say data isn't er critical, but how many chiefs are we going to have all of whom are connected. So, so I actually believe that all of those are going to be melding. And, and so, the, so for me, it doesn't matter. It's, it can be um, artificial intelligence, which has been around for decades. And it can be you know, any, any other technology. Where you need to start is with you know, what's the business objective? What are the outcomes that you're expecting? And then, and then you know, go, go about with that. Now, I'd say with AI and maybe specifically generative AI because you know, it's caught on fire and it's been the last year where everybody's like, oh my god, like, I don't want to stay behind. With that one, I think, yeah, there's got to be some experimentation and like, you know, showing the business case may not necessarily, but before you want to scale, then you certainly, yeah. you've got to say, why am I doing this and you know, how am I going to get there? Oh, and go yeah. ahead. Well, what we're seeing with customers is, yes, they, they all have so many use cases across so many groups. Um, and some of them we can see that they're not really, they don't really understand what the outcome is. And people are telling them, use Gen AI, you gotta use Gen AI, and something magic will happen, right? But it's really well, understanding. Something will happen. Something will happen, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's really, how do you prioritize all of these use cases? Because we've spoken to customers who have literally hundreds of use cases. And some of them are more organized than others, some of them are just trying them all out and seeing what happens. But I think it's really important that you prioritize them. So understand what are the outcomes you need, what's the investment required, what data do you need, what are the risks, you know, are, there, are there data privacy issues, are there ethical issues, pulling all that together and really understanding how should we prioritize these. And what's very different about these use cases as well is it's not always clear that you will reach the outcome that you expect in terms of, of what the application you're building will do. It's been, it's been far easier to determine that historically, but you don't know what you're going to get from an LLM. You don't know which LLM mm. you're going to use. You don't know which data is going to be useful. You don't know how many hallucinations or, or inaccurate responses you're going to get. So there's all, it's also important to be able to pivot when you've, when you've prioritized a use case pivot away from it if it's, if it's not giving you the outcome you expect. So, so essentially what you're saying is we have this very messy, kind of open-ended and confusing environment where, especially when we get involved with Gen AI, we don't actually know what the result will necessarily be. And so to drive that alignment, I'll toss this out to any of the panelists, who should be involved? I think first and foremost, there's got to be support for it at the executive level, and you know, and, and from there, saying you know, what are the areas we need to focus on? But I also think you probably want to have a focus group that really understands AI and the technology and have been working on it for a while, and and then you know, again, each of the business areas, depending on the objectives that you have, whether it's you know, revenue growth, where then you want your p &L leaders to be part of it. If it's efficiency in your claim organization, you, the chief claim officer and their team need to be involved. So it's really governance at all levels, which we actually, by the way, have put in place, I would say, three or four months ago, with our CEO being at the helm of it. Maybe just to add a little bit to that, there is an element of you need to play with new things to understand what they can do. Absolutely agree. There's also an element of you should probably lead with a question or a problem or at least understand how you would know when you were done so that you can measure whether you set out to do something and you're not going to achieve that, but maybe you're going to achieve something better. So the problem and the opportunity formulation is super important. There's a lot of people running around, maybe less so now than seven or eight or nine months ago, but there's still a lot of people running around with the Gen AI hammer saying, you know, what should I hit with this hammer? I, don't, I, I think it's very dangerous to lead with any tool or any data set with the exception of you know, just understanding and experimentation, I think it's very dangerous to say, how can we use Gen AI? It should be better to say, are there unsolved problems right now or unmet opportunities that we can address? And maybe this is one of the tools that we use to address it. Once we get past that, then I know who to have in the room. Otherwise, you wind up 
you know, 17 people can't even order lunch. So <laughs> it's hard if you well, get everybody involved. You could if you have the right governance in the meeting and all of that, but it gets really painful really fast because also 90% of the people in the conversation don't have any idea what the technology really is, and it doesn't stop them from having an opinion on how you should use it. So, uh, and I totally agree. I think at the intersection of all the points you're making, you know, McKinsey came out with research saying there's possibly 63 use cases for enterprise AI. And the reality is that 75% of the value actually comes from three. <laughs> and so it's very much the 80-20, right? And, and those three t typically tend to be around customer experience, ops, so anything operational in your business, like generating new code for our engineers and things like that. Um, and then the, the, third one, the third one's around marketing or generation of content. Uh, so I think there's definitely, just like you're saying, there's a huge risk of just thinking everything's possible and going after use cases that really don't have an end state from a value standpoint. On the roles specifically, we have seen that there's specifically five roles that you need to make sure you have on the team today in order to succeed. And they connect to the idea that I started with, this idea of data products. You need to first have a product manager. You need to hire a data product manager on your team. The job of that person is to own the data from ingestion to activation. That's the CEO of these data products. Just the way software companies build data products, that person needs to write a product requirement document, what will be the input, what will be the outcome. You need to pair that person with uh, what we call UX, uh, uh, a user uh, experience, user interface person, because the best UI is actually no UI. We all know this, right? You don't want to build products for you. You want to build products for the people who adopt it. And I think if anything we've learned from the chatbots is that that's what they taught us, is that, well, there's no UI. I just type in, and it'll give me an answer. The third aspect is you need to have a prog program manager. That person's job is to make sure that when the product manager writes the requirements, they actually get delivered as expressed on time. <laughs> that sounds funny, but it, is, it sometimes does not happen. Um, then there is one person in this room that could particularly help you, Joe Rice over there on the right, who wrote the data engineering book. Data engineer, you need to have data engineers on your team. Um, because this business of data is very, very complicated. And if you don't have data engineers, you know, we talked about data scientists 10 years ago as being the sexiest job. I think actually data engineering, Joe, I don't know if you disagree, is actually the sexiest job in the next 10 years, data engineers. And then the final role, you talked about this as well, you need to have a chief data officer because this can't be something that we think is nice to do. This has to be a mandate. Your CEO needs to hire a CDO or a CDIO that says, this is what we do now. The currency is data. If you don't have that, it's really hard. What we've seen is CDOs that fail, they don't have a mandate. They have a sponsorship. And sponsorship, what that means is I'll give you budget. If you fail, you're on your own. Can't have that. And so it's really hard to get it, but I think it's a sign that we see organizations that fail with this transformation is because their CEO didn't really say that's the way we do things. They said, try it and we'll see what happens. This is not about experimentation. I have to oh. add one thing. My favorite quote from that study that you're talking about. Yeah. It was talking about Gen AI and it said, we've, we've opened up Jurassic Park, we just haven't installed the electric fences yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. So. yeah so. but I, I'd argue though that there's one, one role that's missing. And yeah. that's again, the, the person who says, so what's the question we're focusing yeah. on? Yep. What's the problem we're solving? It's yeah. so important. Right. Yeah. And that's so. where the, the CDO job is very challenging, right? Because you have to be both a business leader and a technology leader. Yeah. And in our experience, the best CDOs do that, right? The, the best CDOs focus on that and they drive the technology roadmap to deliver on the business um, objectives. The ones that tend to have an issue is they start with the governance problem and now they're the no person and nobody wants to have them around the table. And so it's kind of, it's, it's a real difficult job. When you're the other guy, the, I, the <laughs> biggest problem that you have is people giving people what they need, not what they want. Right. Because they'll come to you with an issue. They want to find new customers. Right? Yeah. That's great. We all want to find new customers. Could we refine that a little? And it turns out what you really want to find is new customers that are small businesses that are growing that do business with China. That's not what you said when you started, but we have to yeah. get there. Can I? I mean, he's giving me the opportunity to quote one of my heroes. Just maybe two seconds on that. <laughs> yeah, because he's a local I'm, hero too. I'm but I am but the moderator. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. This is another thing we learn, right? Because this business is about building products. Uh, a lot of the software engineering discipline is applicable, and so to your point, you know, people will tell you what they, they want, but they might not be able to express what they need. My favorite time hero is Clay Christensen, right? And he wrote this book on competing against luck. 
in which he explains jobs to be done. So another big discipline that we've seen these data product managers is to write what is the job that we're trying to do. It's not necessarily that the customer of the product is going to define the specific output they want, but what is the job they're trying to get done? So if you haven't read this book, I think many people probably in the room already have. I'm not teaching you anything you don't know. But that's a big blueprint for how you succeed with data products. Uh, OK, well, so let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, Oh, and it seems like these guys have just started going back and forth across, well, we saw a healthcare panel earlier, this semi-permeable membrane between technology and business. And so when you talk about government, governance, yeah. and then you weave in the data infrastructure, and then, oh, let's layer on top of it, uh, we need a good user interface, and then we need a data engineer how does this get managed? It's like, yeah. it's a, so, kind of a big job. We're saying a lot of our customers are, are centralizing that. So they might have different teams across very different lines of business who, who do very different things, but they're centralizing their AI strategy and, and the tools that they're offering. So they want to make sure that everyone has access to the same tools. They standardize how they approach things, make sure that it's secure, make sure that there's any privacy concerns are addressed and make it easy for, for people to adopt as well. So giving them access to recipes, training, um, a lot of them hold kind of weekly sessions where they talk through the latest technology, because it's evolving all the time and it's very hard to keep up with. So they've centralized this, made it accessible to everyone. Some teams, particularly if I think of financial services, some of the, the hedge funds are a lot more agile. Some of them, the individual teams will do their own thing, but they're still being given the, the, the standard that they should follow provided by a central team. And that, that helps them understand which models should I be using? How should I be accessing them? What are the best models to use for the, the right use case? What are the vector databases I should be looking at? Standardizing all of that so that people know which tools to, to use and, and how to access them easily. Because it's just there's too much noise and there's too much to choose from unless you, you standardize that. Moshkin, you work for a large, very large organization. and. How do you view the way all this should be organized, whether, whether it travelers or just, in, just more broadly? Yeah, and, and, and you know, so when I refer to the fact that we've got a steering right now, that's really focused more on Gen AI and based on the explosion, everyone's saying, let's, let's be coordinated, let's not have everybody just run off and do, do their thing. So it's a little bit of what Owen was saying in that, you know, the foundation from the cloud, by the way, you, you know, you got to be in the cloud if, if you want to do this. Like you, this won't run on your own kind of like on-prem stuff. So um, the foundation's got to be in place. The data's got to be in place, you know, and, and the model that you said, Bruno, for me, yeah, that brings, yeah. that makes the data right. However, if you don't have the right APIs <laughs> to be actually integrating back into your systems, there's, you know, you can have your AI running beside you, but you can't really kind of like put it inside the workflows that's going to make the difference in your operations. So for all of that to work, you know, I'd say, the, again, the team that you described with a product owner and a yeah. program manager and you know, a, a data engineer and perhaps a software engineer and so on, we do that for all, every, any platform or product that you're building. So like the product yeah. mindset applies to any solution. And you know, it's IT organizations that really have moved to the, the product mindset that operate yeah. like software companies are the ones who are getting the results. Yeah. Um, and so you know, the, the way we're set up is we've got the central team that has built the ML ops and has, has, you know, it takes care of the data uh, products yeah. that are critical to us. But then we federate the execution of you know, the business case where you're, you're building that within teams, within, you know, again, cross-functional teams with a product owner and all the experts and you know, what you need to have. Yeah. The, the data landscape is so different w w with these use cases as well. So we, it's roughly 20% of, of data is, is structured and traditionally would have been driving a lot of uh, applications in the past. It's about 80% within an organization unstructured data, and that's all a candidate now for these use cases. So understanding that data, identifying which data should be used, which is more reliable than others, that's, that's a huge challenge. So, so CDOs really have their work cut out with this, I think, to, to really try and standardize what they're doing. Yeah, this is a really interesting point. And I think most of us, I'm assuming actually all of us in this room, are comfortable dealing with and managing structured data. 
What about the unstructured data? Does that change things? Completely. Completely. Why completely? So unstructured data doesn't come with an ontology. It doesn't tell you what it think it's, thinks that it contains. It doesn't follow rules. It doesn't necessarily have metadata that is useful in order to understand how it may or may not be used. Sounds like a toddler. A part, you know, it's like an adolescent. <laughs> it's going to do what it wants. Uh, but the, you, depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, unstructured data, by, by definition, when you bring it in and adjust it and put it into a model, you're structuring it. Uh, think of uh, the example I use all the time. This is not a political comment. It's just easy to understand. If I use the word Trump today, it's probably a proper noun. If I used it 20 years ago, it was probably a verb. Large language models have consumed language over lots of time. The way we use that word has changed. So has the way we use lots of other words. And we used to talk a lot about machine learning and AI, and a lot of people would just say AI ML as if it were one thing. Um, now we talk about artificial intelligence and, and gen AI, and, and so the terminology changes, the concepts change, and we don't necessarily have the right language to describe the concepts right away. So unstructured data is by its very definition missing pieces, it contains a lot of bias, it doesn't have any directions, and now you want to use it to make a decision. That's fine. Just be careful what decision you ask. A lot of my career has been spent looking for bad guys, uh, uh, fraudsters, human trafficking, things like that. Uh, certainly with the Stimson Center, a lot of the, the challenges that they have are on these corner cases, right? If you're looking at what the masses are saying, it's hard to understand those corner cases. So be careful what you ask for, because you might get it. But if you can, if you can bring the unstructured data, that's sometimes where the Absolutely. huge value, value is, right? It, like your customer a, yes. preferences. Like if you've got the recordings that you know from from the conversations that they've had with your service representatives, text, images, and, yes. and all of that. But it is hard to integrate. There's a no doubt about it. A lot it. of the work that I've done has been in understanding missingness. So I'll just take those conversations, right? Uh, if you know that people don't call the call center to say, hi, I love your product, right? <laughs> First of all, you know that you have a biased set True. True. to start with. So anybody that says anything positive in that biased set, mm -hmm. you can almost multiply it by some factor, right? Because yeah. they didn't call to say they were happy most of the time. The people that don't speak about something, sometimes what isn't said is as important as what is said, right? Yeah. So it's about, there's a reason why we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, because those are three different things, <laughs> right? So we have to think about that in terms of what does that corpus contain, and what does it not contain, and how do I understand it in the context of a complex question? Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's, right. we talk about problems and opportunities, but. What we're seeing, it's far more on the opportunity side of things with yeah, this new data, sure. because our customers are super excited about what, what, how can we add more value with all this data that we've never used before, really, or used in such a manual way that we just couldn't really process it fast enough to, for it to be meaningful. So massive opportunity, but yeah, there's just there's work to be done to ensure that you're, you're building a solution that's pulling out the right data, that's, and traceability is very important as well. So why was, that, why was that, that decision made and going back to the source data? What about the organizational uh, skills, talents, capabilities in order that we must have in place in order to be able to manage the structured, the unstructured, and the transition from structured to unstructured data? Any thoughts, Bruno? I just wanted to come back to the data quality problem because I think that's, um, I think just like you said, you know, if you look at research today, $4.4 trillion of value created in this enterprise AI space, so we can get really excited. I think the risk is getting too excited with the new, but then forgetting the old, right? And there are, there's some truth about our industry that we know, and the, the truth is people will only use our products if they could trust it, right? And thankfully, when you look at how structured and unstructured data is used, there's a few companies you can look at, for example, is one of them. Uh, does search on the internet, you can, you can look into, into them. They, they've got some really good practices. But the, the truth about it is that data quality is the first thing that we need to tackle, right? Because if we don't have that, then the solutions are not trusted. It doesn't really matter how sexy your application is. Uh, I feel weird about saying this here because I come from Silicon Valley and we're always really proud about inventing the stuff there, but in fact, the, the origin of data quality framework comes from someone at MIT, Richard Wong, 
1991, published this paper, 20 Dimensions of Data Quality. I'm not going to take you through all 20 dimensions, but essentially I came up with my own acronym to remember that with customer. I call it RAT. I know it's not the most elegant acronym, but what it stands for is data quality is assessed by richness. So how rich is your data? How complete is it? How can people look at it and say, yes, this is in fact the data that I can want and, and, tr and trust. Uh, trust uh, is often seen as certified data sets in what we call rich. A is actionable. Is this data actually relevant to the person so they can relate to it and ultimately uh, take action, right? Often we think about the data as the end of the story, you know, the action is the end of the story. It's kind of when we read a book, the point is not reading, it's understanding so we can act on it. Same thing with data. And T is timely, right? If I told you that it rained yesterday, that's, a, that's accurate, it's rich, but it's not really uh, relevant. And so we think about these three dimensions and how you design around it. I'll give you, uh, you know, a way, a way to think about it is we have lots of customers that forget about aligning around these principles. And Gartner says, I think the, the cost of bad data is $13 million per year or something like this. I think that's over and uh, underestimating it. I think it's a lot more expensive than that. But the reason for why I'm saying that is often people migrate into the cloud or migrate into a new environment or a new tool and so forth, and they don't take care of data quality, they find themselves having to go back, and it's very expensive. And so I'd say, you know, I wanted to make sure we didn't forget that notion because you asked a question about data quality is absolutely the first thing. It is the foundation of everything else we do. In large-scale transformation project, projects, among the top three of every... Can you uh, uh, make sure it's mic up, please? In large-scale <laughs> transformation projects, among the top three things that I wish I could go back and do better... Is data quality? Always data quality. Every single study you read, data quality is on that list. Yeah. And then the other two will vary. Data quality is always there. And here's the bad news about it, right? Uh, uh, Gen AI is going to amplify it when you have bad data. Yeah. So this is why it, not only was it it's old, right? It's important, but it's becoming more and more important. Is and what and because it's unstructured, how will you know? Right. So with structured data, we can. There's measures of central tendency. We have means and standard deviation and average. You, you, you know all this math you can do. Can't do that on unstructured data. So how do you know the value of how your answer might have changed if you had different data? It's a very difficult thing to measure that elasticity of the value of the data when it's unstructured. There are ways to do it, but they're not for the light of heart. So there's so, one. Sorry, oh, ahead, sorry, can I interrupt? But now we're at the point in our conversation where literally we're going to run out of time. <laughs> so now we have to kind of uh, step it along because there's a bunch of other topics that we have to cover. So. Owen, uh, Bruno just mentioned, or maybe it was Anthony, just mentioned this notion of success. So how do we measure the success? What kind of KPIs do we need to have in place when we talk about uh, Gen AI initiatives? Right. So I think it all goes back to what I said earlier about how you're defining each of these use cases. Right? A, a key part of that is going to be how you measure success. Right. So. They typically break down into, into two, two different areas. So one is efficiency. So things like chatbots to allow people to get the answer more quickly or document summary, Q&A, things like that. Um, in general, those should be pretty easy to measure. So are we getting through more work because we're more efficient? Um, but absolutely important that you define that up front. So how are you measuring that and how are you confirming it? Um, the other one is more around innovation um, so it's, it's, a, it's a new innovative use case that's, that's generating new value. So again, it's predicting what kind of value that's generating. So it might be around, um, let's say, in manufacturing, you're, you're using pattern matching and anomaly detection to predict uh, when, uh, when something is going to break and predictive maintenance. Or it might be um, identifying a new opportunity for your financial services, leveraging unstructured data with your structured data to, to give you more information to improve your, your P&L, right, to make better trading decisions. So it's just important that you define the metric. If you can't define a metric, then it's probably not a use case that should be high up your list. So I, we, we think of it, I mean, along those lines, but for us, our three priorities are, you know, we're an insurance company, so risk and evaluation of risk is at, at the top. Because mm -hmm. if you do that well, both your losses, uh, I mean, your losses will be lower, and that's where profitability comes in. Um, secondly, it's experiences. So again, the ability to actually improve experiences 
um, is the second one. And then the third is productivity and efficiency, as you said. And so for us, you know, with anything that we start doing, any, any technology that we're putting in place, we set, set our goals along those lines and then, you know, from there drive down KPIs that the teams um, align to. But that's on the business side. I think when it comes to measuring the outcome, you've also got to see, you know, evaluate the performance of your models. And to your point, if, if you've got bad data, yeah. you know, the accuracy of, of that and the reliability and trustworthiness is, is, is not there. So you've got to have measures for both of those things. So when you mean experience, external and internal? Yeah, exter your, your in our case, our customers, our agents and brokers, and then employee experiences. Yeah. You know, employee experiences can be a big thing, too. Yeah. To what extent do you guys think that the data quality out there in the world among large companies is good, medium, bad? How big of an issue is this data quality? It's big. <laughs> it's big. And, and, and getting worse. And getting worse. Because we're expecting more and more from that data. So we're training models on it. We're ingesting it into things where we can't find it anymore once it's in there. It's very hard to unlearn things in some of these uh, convolutional methods that are being used. So the quality of the data going in is is becoming increasingly an issue that we're going to pay for later, and it, it's very hard to unlearn. That's why I think there's always got to be a human in the loop, yeah. so to speak, because we are not at the point where we can just depend on these machines. I hope we won't be there too soon. Either. And a lot of times we're using data for purposes it was never intended for. So the, the perfect example is that field that says comments. Yeah. Right? Years ago, people used to put things in there like the, the, the callback number or the credit card number in comments, right? Now there's laws against doing things like that. So um, do you go back and clean all your data and make sure it doesn't contain any numbers in the comments field? You can't do that. It, it's very hard to, to go back in time. And unfortunately, the expectations of data quality in terms of what do you want to pay for? Who wants to pay for data quality? Raise your hand. Yeah, nobody puts their hand up, and every, we all need it. OK, Anthony, you just used the term con convolutional methods. Yes. So let's talk about corporate culture. Yes. I try not to say that in a corporate <laughs> setting, but <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> How important is this notion of d developing a uh, data culture inside a company? And does it really make a difference? Moshkin, you? Yeah, I think it makes all the difference in the world. So think of you know, the fields you talked about, and think of your service representative. And the customer calls, and you, you're writing a new policy for them. And then it says, like, data of, let's say, I don't know, date of birth, and you, you forgot to have that. And then you just put your daughter's. We literally had a case where the service rep was putting her daughter's date of birth for like every one of these Look things. All our customers so, are born on the same day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, probably around three years ago or something, we started this initiative around you know, data culture and making sure that every single employee at Travelers really understands data, their accountability, their ownership, that they got to make sure it's as complete as possible, that it's accurate. And we, we've now gone, you know, majority of the people have actually gone through this training. Now, I'm not suggesting the things that were happening before aren't, but you know, you've got you've to be able to push this all the way to the front lines. So let me double click on that a little bit. If I'm a sales guy and my commission happens after I get this form in uh. <laughs> and it has a piece of data that I don't have that's mandatory. Yeah, incentives. Right? Yeah. So if my incentive is that I took the training and they said it's important to get it right, you know, okay, it's important to do a lot of things I don't do, like eat vegetables, you know. So what would you do? I, I'm not suggesting, <laughs> I'm just saying that I've seen no, this a lot point. where you know, if you can click through something, the field that's mandatory, that's yeah. that's open text, you put a space in it and it lets you go, yeah. you do that in well, a that's, survey. That's why I think um, having the unstructured data is so critical because if you get, and, and I'm not suggesting that's easy to do, but if you get to the point where that call and the, you know, the output of that call is the actual voice of the customer saying these things, then, mm -hmm. you know, you're removing that middle person that can make those mistakes. One of the things I've done, I'm not saying this is the only answer, is to gamify it. So um, okay, uh, taking okay. date of birth as an example, you know, um, we're looking for as, as broad a range as possible in our contacts. Jerry, all of your people are 16 years old. You lose, right? <laughs> I, I'm over 
you know, um, exaggerating yeah. it to, to make a point. But if you can somehow gamify the quality of the data, mm -hmm. that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't want to name companies, but there's a ride-sharing app that gamifies the collection of data mm. quite okay. nicely. I like, right? I like that. There, there's a catch here, right? Uh, absolutely, data culture, and again, Randy, sorry for keeping using your research there, but I think it's number one uh, you know, issue with adoption, right? Uh, and the first catch that I would say where we see enterprises really kind of missing the mark is um, culture is not what you say, it's what you do. So it's great that you have posters, but you really have to implement it. The, that is definitely true. The other part of it is also expecting people to get into a workflow that actually is not theirs. You know how if you have salespeople and you're trying to incent them to enter data into CRM, it's going to give you a great CRM, but it might not give you a lot of sales. <laughs> Uh, if you're trying to train your marketing people that are supposed to talk to, to their customers all day long, but you want them to become data analysts, that's not the right culture. And so I think you have to be able as a leader to, to find, identify what is the core of this person, why did I hire them, and in my attempt to making the company data driven, am I also changing the job description? Because if I want more data analysts, I should go hire that. So I think there's a fine line where, where people kind of get stuck. Uh, a great company to look up that you can uh, search online, you could Google if you want, uh, is a company called Mercado Libre. It's the Amazon of, of Latin America. 80% adoption of their data products, and a lot of it is because they're training at the role level, and they have clear expectations of who needs to do what. It's part of their culture. It's, it's my it's, turn. It's your turn. Oh, it's talking to you, okay. <laughs> I thought you were leaking. <laughs> that's also, that's equally possible. Uh, <laughs> Oh, and let's change gears slightly. Your, your consulting organization, as you talk with your customers, how important is the concept of ecosystems and partnerships when it comes to accomplishing this very complex set of tasks, activities, and goals that we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, the, the overall architecture requires a lot of components you know, from, from partners, third-party software vendors, um, again, back to different models you're using, where you're going to host this. Um, so it is very important and, and to understand what, what, is, what is the bigger picture, right? So end-to-end, -end, there's, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of these use cases being explored. It, it's, it's typically done with smaller data sets. It's very exploratory, but productionizing that is a, is a whole different story. And a lot of organizations are struggling with that. So how do I actually roll this out and make it available? So that's where you need to really leverage partners, leverage other tools to make sure that you're, you've got a solid foundation in place. It's also because the environment of your organization is complex today, and it's not getting simpler. Right? I mean, we talked about it. As much as I would like all of you to be in one cloud, it's never going to happen. Right? We're going to have multi-cloud. You're going to have hybrid. And so the reality of your world is you have distributed data, distributed users in the case of when you said empower and federate, you know, this concept of data mesh, that means you're going to have more people of multiple different profiles interacting with more data. It's going to become complex. The currency, the one thing that's going to make all of us succeed is your ability to simplify. And that's why I think empowering, you know, and harnessing the, the power of the ecosystem enables you to provide a simple interface in front of this complex world. So simple rather than convolutional. Yes. Uh, quickly, because we want to take audience. Do, do you guys want to ask questions? Put up your hand if you want to ask. Yes. So, I, so I, quickly. I said that things should be made as as simple as possible, but no simpler. Right. Uh -huh. Some of the things that we're trying to do require a bit of complexity, or you're just going to get an overly simplified answer that you can't use. So I, I, I was really hoping we could sort of wrap this up with a nice little bow. And what I've just learned is that far from doing that, we've just opened Pandora's box, <laughs> and OK, David, we're going to be here for what? I would say three hours. <laughs> Do we have uh, four? So settle in for the long haul, folks. No, seriously. OK, let's take some questions. Um, sir, at this front table. I don't, I don't know if there's a microphone, but yeah, so hang on for the mic. We only have about 10 minutes or so for questions. So uh, ask your questions succinctly. So that the moderator and panelists can like really catch it quickly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Great panel, of wonderful insights. Uh, one thing that we, we were looking at the topic, say, an enterprise AI playbook. Is there a such thing called playbook, or if there is one 
one game plan or in the playbook, if you were to put one play, which one do you put, each of you? Well, th th two of you. Sorry, I'm going to run out of time. So is there a single playbook, or what's the most important playbook? Um, data, and quality data, and start small. Quality data and start small. Anybody want to take a shot at another one? Pay attention to how the environment is changing while you're building the thing you're building, because it's probably going to change. It's all going to change. Oh, and you look like you were going to say something. I think structured and unstructured data, seeing how those, you can marry those together to really open up new use cases and new value. I think that's, that's what's really getting our customers excited. Yeah, and, and thus the idea of any type of unified playbook is out the window. OK. Uh, <laughs> questions, other questions? Can I ask another quick question? Um, it's great to hear about data quality. Um, I know AI needs data, data needs AI, right? Yeah. Uh, so we, are, we have so much data we are capturing. Can, how can AI help in the data quality? Can you guys talk about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, in fact, we've had customers who have taken their AI out to the customer interface and realized actually they're not ready for that, and they're taking the AI back into helping them with metadata management and cleaning their data. And so I think there's a huge amount of space where companies are going to come out with using AI to get you better quality data before you get it in front of companies. There are actually lots of ways that AI has been used over the last n years already uh, for metadata discovery, for combining product uh, data catalogs. Uh, companies that get involved in mergers and acquisitions and divestitures, they have to fold their data on top of each other. There are AI tools that help to do that. There are certainly tools that will help find things like veracity, you know, the likelihood that things are true or not true. Those frames that I talked about before are part of one of those patents that Michael was talking about. So the AI has been involved in looking at the data for a long time. And I hope that with Gen AI, we get better at saying things like, what are the, the most common issues that I have with my data? Kind of hard to look at your data and answer a question like yeah. that. but. You know. Yeah, we didn't talk about data fabric and intelligent semantic layers, but that's really the space there. I mean, I didn't answer the playbook answer, but I think a lot of what we see is, first step is make sure you nail the basics before you get too excited about the, the new stuff. You got to new the new stuff, but you can't do it without nailing the basics. The catchphrase that people use when it comes to using data is freedom within the framework. And I think you were talking about that. You have a framework and then you let people interact, but you can't do that if you don't have the basics. I used so, to I was sorry. I was going to say, if you have questions about data fabric, Bruno has been talking about the data fabric ever since I've met you. Yeah. yeah. So catch him after the panel. He's he's yeah. your guy. Uh, other questions uh, in the back, uh, Elizabeth. And keep it short and sweet, please. Uh, well, okay. Uh, there. Uh, regarding. The issue of data quality. There are times that the, we assign a meaning to data, and that shapes how we interpret everything that comes from it. For example, this whole mm -hmm. thing of like this uh, uh, retail loss, you know, fr from it could be spoilage, it could be theft, and this number apparently is undifferentiated between all of the, the possible causes of. Yeah. of, uh, of uh, uh, retail loss. Yeah. And one of the things also is the value of that loss. You know, 20 years ago, the dollar was of a certain value. Now that dollar is worth more. So we don't, you know, so we attribute that there's this huge increase in the value of loss. Then we say, then someone says, they're quoting it because it's undifferentiated, that it's all, it's all theft. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so so, so how can, do you how do you yeah. ad address the fact that you can have data and attribute a meaning to it, but it totally changes its meaning in terms of what you attribute I, and what you I, do with it? So, there's always somebody in the crowd who talks about the relative context and meaning of data, making things yet even more complicated. Anthony, very quickly. So I'll give you two, because we're pressed for time, there's two sciences that I would point to. In the, the original first predicate of your question, there's something called progressive decomposition, which is taking that big concept like loss and breaking it down into smaller pro concepts 
until you get to something that's autonomous, that you can't break down any further. And you measure at that level, and then you roll up to the broader concept. So that works really well with structured data. With unstructured data, the ugly cousin of progressive decomposition is something called semantic disambiguation, which is deriving semantic meaning from a whole bunch of language. What are the nouns, the verbs, the adverbs? Uh, is there possible neologism? Is there any chance that sarcasm is being used? Those are sort of the squishy, ugly versions of doing that in unstructured data. Gen AI is horrible at that right now. Absolutely horrible. But it'll get there. OK. Uh, Great way to end that. Uh, so <laughs> in the back. Yep. Quick question. This is for Bruno. Uh, when we look at the stack of technology required for AI, where is Capital G focusing on investing? Yeah, so thanks for asking the question. So Capital G for Context is Alphabet's independent fund. So we invest in data, AI, analytics, and cybersecurity organizations at growth phase. So that's Series B and up. Organizations in our portfolio are Databricks, Colibra, UiPath, um, there's many of them, so I'm probably forgetting. But just to answer that question, that's the space uh, we're in. Do you work at Google or Capital G, or why did you? That's a good question. Thank you for letting me say that. Did we record that? <laughs> yeah. That's, that was the reason. I was, I was more thinking like within the, the infrastructure, the tooling, or the applications, do you focus on a specific area? Oh, I see what you're saying. No, we, we, we play in all three, in fact. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? We have time for a few more. Uh, sir? In the middle? And keep it short, please. Simple. Yeah. I loved hearing all the key words, uh, quality, generative AI, products, data products, um, quality, and I mean, Co almost all the fun stuff. Uh, what's the future uh, looking like? I mean, uh, I have a hypothesis, but I want to hear it from you all. Actually, let me intercept that and ask each of you in turn to give us a tweet length view of the future of any important technology. So you want to say, should we say Gen AI or data infrastructure, whatever you want? So, uh, Mashkin, you want to? I, I mean, I'd say with Gen AI, I, I don't think we know. I mean, I don't think there's anyone who can actually predict, you know, where we're going to be with this thing in three years. And then the other thing that we don't know is like, is, is it all going to come together in two years or is it in 10 years? So, you know, okay. let's wait I, and see. <laughs> more, more of this convolutional uncertainty. Yeah. I don't think it's going to converge. I think we're going to develop new language that we don't have today to talk about it. And it's going to actually bifurcate into multiple things. So my tweet would be, you know, fail, fail, I see your book there, you know. Oh, it's Randy's uh, book. Uh, I see Sorry. Randy's book there. Um, you know, fail fast, but make new mistakes. Right, we, we have to not hurry up and make the same old mistake we made last time. Because with Gen AI, we have the ability to make, make mistakes much faster which much, with much larger corpora of data, and that is really dangerous. Wow, that's, okay, difficult to follow. So, so I'll just say it's a long a really tweet. No, that's a very long tweet, but it's a good one. Um, <laughs> positive outlook on the world. I will say, don't reinvent the wrong wheel would be kind of my, right, um, because. That's good. I think there are a lot of things that we know are true that we definitely don't want to repeat. We talked about data quality. To, to your uh, perspective on the future, I'm really excited about it because I think one of the issues we've all had in this room is we've invested millions of dollars and we haven't been able to really make it clear to everybody in the organization the um, value of it. I know I hear you, but I'm just going to look at, <laughs> lock on you. Uh, and I think the uh, opportunity to make better decisions, maybe more autonomous decisions of a higher quality is in front of us. How quickly? I don't know. Because I think the challenge is, and this actually came out in the HBR of the last, this, the latest HBR uh, paper. Um, it's really going to be challenging to train your people because the technology is almost evolving faster than your ability to train them. Yep. So that's going to be a challenge. Nope. Okay, and Owen, you're next really quick, and let's try to get one more question. Yeah, I just one said, last thing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just see the, the growth continuing to explode. I think it's a really accessible technology for people to get their hands on and actually start building out use cases. It, it's, it's, the hype is, is justified this time. With machine learning in the past, it was, it was very hard to adopt, but now this, these use cases are so easy to build out that I think it's just going to continue to explode. Easy use cases, it's going to grow. Okay, really quickly, who, one more. Okay, in the back. Quick, quick, quick. Yeah, hello. Uh, between the four of you, we have like decades worth of AI experience. I was wondering how frequently as a percentage do you see successful AI prototypes 
uh, to fail to transition into production? And what are some of the contributing factors to that gap? OK, going from prototype to production, how often do they fail and what causes failure? Uh, anybody? Quick. I would say the vast majority fail to make it to production. Um, I think, to my point earlier, a lot of the business outcomes aren't well defined to start with. Um, I do think scalability and reliability is very important as well. So something works in a test bed, you try and bring in much more data, much more diverse data, and it just doesn't behave the way expected to, or some, some part of the chain just breaks. So I'd say the majority. We have enough fail. time for one other person to. OK, I'm going I'm to quote HBR, because this is Boston, right? So the last HBR article I read about this for this month, 80% failure rate in AI today, which is twice the failure rate of the average IT project in the last decade, so high failure rate. Uh, our observation has been around the lack of product mindset, data product mindset around it. So there's lots of things around that. We can unpack it if you want offline. But I think really embracing this idea of building data products is going to help you drive adoption. Great. And with that, thank you so much, everybody, for your great questions. And thanks to this great panel. <laughs>